Good afternoon, and what a beautiful afternoon it is. I am Bente Toriusen, Eva's Executive Director, and it is a great honor for me to welcome you to tonight's very special event. Nature Vision, Finding Meaning at the Intersection of Art and Science is the title of the gallery talk that will be presented by Rob Kester, whose stunning photographs, hand-colored images of microscopic plant material, fill the walls in the Rebecca Ga uh, Lawrence Gallery entry and in the Clifford B. West Gallery, where we are gathered. And by Gar Waterman, whose magnificent marble, onyx and travertine sculptures are on display in the same spaces. So in the course of the duration of this exhibition, which opened four weeks ago, I have been struck by the fact that participants from our many art classes and community programs for children and teens have been drawn into our gallery spaces again and again and been completely immersed in looking at the photographs and the sculptures. So powerful has the attraction to these artworks been that our instructors on several locations transformed the galleries into art studios, making easels and drawing boards, pastels and paints and crayons and pencils available. The young students were instantaneously drawn into close observation of the work on display. Observations that led to fascinating visual interpretations of what they were looking at. And isn't close observation an essential component of both art and science? So I dare say that our young students, in their own way, found meaning in the intersection of art and science. Before I introduce the two artists, I would like to extend a special thank you to New Hampshire Humanities for a generous grant in support of this event. A particular thank you A particular thank you goes to Susan Hedlam, their associate director, for seeing to it that funding came our way. Given their mission statement, that the New Hampshire Humanities nurtures the joy of learning and inspires community engagement by bringing life-enhancing ideas from the humanities to the people of New Hampshire. Their support seems particularly appropriate as a gallery talk will be followed by a discussion about the connection between art and science, how the disciplines inform one another, and the implications for humanity and nature. This discussion will be led by Eva's exhibition director, Margaret Jacobs, who is there in the back, who, together with our intern, Jennifer Lay, so expertly installed the exhibition. Many thanks as well go to Catherine Hart, senior curator of collections at the Wood Museum of Art who served as a designated New Hampshire humanities expert for this program and event. A thank you as well, and always, goes to Rich Fedorchak, our volunteer par excellence, a wonderful artist who is a really pro at setting up our spaces and our, all our systems of sound and sight. I would also like to extend many thanks to Dartmouth College's Biology Department and the Life Sciences Center, and particularly to Elizabeth Smith, Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Without their support and participation, this exhibition would not have been possible. A special thank you goes to Biology Professor Eric Schaller. Eric, where are you? Uh, For several years has helped make possible amazing 
art and science focused art camps for children and teens to take place here at EVA, thanks to grants he secured from the National Science Foundation. He and his wife, Paulette Berger, EVA board member and talented metal artist, were driving forces in making possible that the Nature Revision exhibit came to EVA. As an aside, though not really as an aside, I would rather say, in plain sight, I would like to point out that Paulette, in fact, also has work on display here right now in the Elizabeth Rowan Mayer Gallery, right behind this wall, uh, with an exhibition titled Vegetable, Animal, Mineral. A thematically related perfect complement to the Nature Revision exhibition, so be sure, please, to check it out afterwards. Where do the observational skills of an artist and science intersect? How do art and science inspire and expand larger conversations about the world? These are some of the questions that will be touched upon in the gallery talk, as well as in the discussion that will follow. So now, a few words of introduction about our distinguished artists and gallery speakers. Rob Kessler is a professor at Central St. Martin's College of Art and Design and Chair of Arts, Design and Science at the University of the Arts in London, England. He was a NESTA Fellow, that is a Fellow of the National Endowment for Science, Technology and Arts, at the Royal Botanical Gardens at Kew and was recently made a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, the Linnaean Society, and the Royal Microscopical Society. Over the past decade, Kessler has worked extensively with bot botanical scientists at Kew, exploring the creative potential of microscopic plant material. His work is inspired by the exotic form and luscious colors of the plant world. The photographs on display here at EVA are hand-colored micrographs, images photographed through a microscope and printed on aluminum. We are fortunate indeed that Dartmouth brought Kessler to the Upper Valley as part of an Andrew W. Mellon Fellowship. Just yesterday, he presented a Mellon seminar in the Life Sciences Center titled Convergent Territories. Gar Waterman of New Haven, Connecticut, received a BA in French from Dartmouth, though his particular interest in art led him to a career as a sculptor. Inspired by his father, the pioneering underwater filmmaker Stan Waterman, and spending his formative years in Tahiti, his daily contact with the exotic flora of the Polynesian landscape and the barrier reefs of the South Pacific informed his subsequent work as a sculptor exploring organic form. After graduating from Dartmouth, Waterman lived for seven years in Pietro Santa, Italy, and we both try to get back into that Italian conversation tonight. <laughs> um, and there he acquired his extraordinary skills of carving in stone. Waterman also works in wood, bronze, and steel, creating carefully crafted works of art that reflects his fascination with evolution's exquisite sense of design. He has won numerous awards, and his work is in many private and public collections. In 2014, Waterman installed a monumental bronze sculpture commissioned by Dartmouth College for the class of 1978 Life Sciences Center. The sculpture is, appropriately, titled Feral Seed, a title that he has also applied to many of his sculptures including, included in this exhibition. In conclusion, I just wanted to mention how this exhibition came about through one connection that led to another, that led to another, in the most organic manner. When Waterman's Feral Seed sculpture was inaugurated, Paulette Berger was present. Since he always wears an Ava hat wherever she is, and in particular when she encounters a sculptor, 
keep in mind that she has been deeply involved with the planning of our nearly completed Skirpol Studies building. Take a look when you go up. So she introduced herself to Waterman and invited him to come and visit her studio here in the Ava building. As, and also to learn more about Ava. When he came to her studio, Paulette showed him some books that she often used to refer to as a source of inspiration for her work. These were books on seeds and pollen by Rock Kessler. Waterman looked at them, became fascinated, wrote down the names, ordered the books, and long story short, contacted Kessler with the suggestion that they consider planning having an exhibition together at Dartmouth. The Hood Museum was to have been involved, but because of unforeseen changes there, the exhibition came Ava's way, and we could not be more pleased. Please join me in welcoming Rob Kessler and Gar Waterman. To see Ava, uh, that story is entirely true. Uh, Paulette is very much responsible. And uh, Lebanon, New Hampshire, in the day when I was here at school, in the mid 70s, was well, a pretty tough place. And so when she said, Yeah, we have this wonderful place in Lebanon, I sort of raised an eyebrow and said, mm, Okay. But of course, this is an extraordinary place. And, and, uh, what they do, especially with kids, uh, is exactly what needs to be done. I'm so glad to hear that this show has accomplished some of that to, to a degree in engaging children in looking at nature. Uh, Rob and I have been doing, God, this is our fourth or fifth round of this. Um, <laughs> you're, you're getting the last. And, and I hope not the uh, least. But uh, a big part of it has been talking about how important observation is. And uh, as, as, as has been pointed out, the, uh, the, the connection between art and science is very strong, that they both are very much based on observation. And I, I feel like we're losing that a little bit in the modern world where our worlds are being narrowed down to screens that we look at rather than the real thing. So to hear the children came in as part of the educational programming and were entranced and then used these pictures and sculptures to do their own creative things and hopefully make them go out and look at other things in nature is really wonderful. Uh, do I, will you? Yeah, I can. Okay, so I'll just, I'll just ask you. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the other artists whose work I find intriguing and who I think are doing some interesting things uh, that you could say were inspired by science, but really are, are taking the organic matrices of the natural world and using creative ways to bring them out in their artwork to show people. Uh, my first slide simply sort of a way of showing how very little can, uh, can change over time. You have the famous French paintings from, from La Chaux there, uh, some of the oldest artwork known. And on the right you have a Deborah Butterfield from you know, uh, not so long ago. And you can, it's not hard to see the similarities. So this, uh, this love of nature, which, which uh, Aristotle was the first one to, to talk about it, or mythicism, you call it, where we, we have this need to observe nature and mimic it in a way in our art, uh, really runs through all of our known history. Um, all right. uh, 
This is uh, on your left, you have, of course, an Autobahn print. Uh, on the right, you have a wonderful contemporary artist named James Prosek, quite famous for his book about trout. Uh, James was doing a whole series that he called an unnatural history, uh, kind of an ironic uh, interpretation of traditional botanical illustration with some aberration. Uh, okay. Uh, scale is something I also want to talk about tonight. Both Rob and I take things that are typically tiny in real life and blow them up. Rob to a much greater degree than I do, but uh, the mechanism of scale in art is uh, tried and true and used frequently by a lot of artists. Um, okay, next, this is a that was a Klaus Oldenburg, of course. Uh, this is a photographer, uh, Gilles Ravel, Gilles, or Giles Ravel, I guess, uh, who does electron microscopy of insect forms, and a bit like Rob, cleans them up and floats them on a clean black background, and then literally these prints are that big. So a creature that uh, you can barely see uh, suddenly becomes an entirely different thing, and the topographies of their exoskeletal forms become a, a sort of a, an entire voyage of sculptural uh, feast when you when you really start to look closely at it. Uh, okay, uh, this is Jason Hackenworth, a wonderful sculptor who managed to successfully take the very prosaic form of art uh, balloon time, which pre pretty much until he came along was limited to kids' birthday parties, um, and turned it into a most extraordinary art form where he creates these very biomorphic uh, assemblages that are nothing more than tied balloons, uh, you know, fantasy creatures of, at, at a, almost a, a cellular structure. And uh, you can go to the next one. And has been extremely successful. He travels the world, he does these marvelous installations that uh, you know have this reference to, to biological forms that you, you cannot miss. And they're, they are ephemeral, which is a kind of neat thing because, of course, the balloons eventually lose their air and collapse, so they have a, a lifespan another connection with the, the real world, right? Uh, this is Luke Jerome, uh, who collaborated with Burroughs Welcome, the British drug company. Uh, they had him create these gorgeous glass sculptures. This, these are big, again, so scale. These are some of the world's deadliest viruses, Ebola, SARS, uh, various other assorted nasties that in his hands and transferred into another media, okay, uh, become these very beautiful things. And uh, there are endless examples of this, of course, in nature, where the deeper you go and the closer you look, the more fascinating the forms become. And in this case, it was uh, you know, a lovely irony that, that these horrible things uh, were so beautiful. Okay, next. Wonderful work. Uh, okay. Another extraordinary uh, vision is James Baylog, who did the film Chasing Ice. Some of you might have seen that. It's a film about retreating glaciers. And Baylog, uh, his work also touches on something that uh, I think is important to, to bear in mind with the, the art science nexus, which of course is the environment, um, as environmental issues become of ever greater importance to us uh, with global warming and uh, ocean acidification and the extinction of species. Um, the leverage, if you will, that bringing imagery and artwork 
that is rooted in the natural world to as broad a public as possible. Um, I think it, it has a place, it has a job to do, and, and these guys are doing it. Uh, okay, next. These just extraordinary pieces of glacial formations, okay, uh, that catch his eye. And he's got a very beautiful book, if you ever see it, just called Ice. Uh, it has some of the most beautiful images of, of uh, glaciers and, and ice that you'll ever see. Okay. So now I'm just going to dive in a little bit to my own personal story of how I kind of arrived at the back door of, of science and an interest in the science of the creatures that I have sculpted. Uh, I lived in Tahiti for, for a year when I was nine with my dad, as you heard. Uh, for a kid from suburbia, it was a watershed experience. Uh, it was the luck of the draw, and my dad was an underwater filmmaker, and, and he, uh, he took us there. The, okay, we'll go to the next one. The, uh, we spent most of our time in the water, and the marine world, with all its grace and beauty, the sort of you know the, the gravity gravity free environment, uh, made a very deep impression on me. Okay, next. So I worked many times over the years with my dad, uh, a lot of wonderful experiences, and the visuals of the underwater world really became a part of me long before I went into making sculpture. But uh, as I said earlier today, uh, artists really kind of are what they eat. And uh, this was a part of my steady diet when I was younger and certainly came out later, and, uh, okay. Just a couple shots of some gorgeous things in the water. This, this one I wanted to mention, um, one of my favorite sculptures still today uh, is sitting there on the hop on the right of the door when you go in. It's one of Peter Roby's pieces, that beautiful bronze. It almost looks like a shell, but it's actually it's an orchid form, and I, I loved that piece when I was here, and I think it was in part because these rippled, these rippled shapes resonated with me. Uh, okay. All right. So just a, you know, a handful of the beasties that uh, were part of my life working with my dad. So when I do marine forms, okay, um, some of this particular stone, in fact, is in this show. This piece is the same marble as are the, the green guys on the wall there at the entryway. It comes from uh, Iran, and I'll talk a little bit about the stone in the process uh, later. Um, okay. All right. You know, fairly straightforward uh, draws from the creatures themselves. The my. Uh, my process is as much about trying to put some of the fluidity of the subject into such a hard and unyielding material and uh, successfully not make it a static thing in stone, but give it a little bit of life from, from the creature that inspired it, okay? Uh, you can frequently use the coloration in the material to your advantage. Uh, when you look for pieces of stone, uh, it's easy really to see what the color is going to be. You, you always take water with you when you splash it on the stone, and that will reveal pretty much what it will look like when it's polished. Uh, I also work frequently with what is essentially the uh, sort of the cutoffs from the industry of stone, so I root around in their, their uh, stacks of, of pieces that are left over from drought. So this piece, for example, was quite a thin piece that tapered to, to you know, wasn't, the whole piece of stone wasn't thicker than that when I started, so it was like a cut-off wedge. And uh, I often use the shape of the stone, and when I go and shop for stone, I'll pick and choose, and, 
pick out pieces that interest me, but I almost never, for example, buy a square block. I, I love buying things that are, have a broken edge, or thinner here, or thicker here. It gives me a place to start. Uh, okay. Shells, of course, all of these forms that, that I first saw when I was in Tahiti. Uh, another gorgeous uh, orange onyx from Iran. Iran doesn't just export uh, terror and bad things. It has a lot of fabulous materials. Okay. This one as well, brown onyx from Iran. Uh, that's Afghani, that part of the world uh, geologically very interesting. Okay. And so one of my favorites, this is the same crazy pink stone as that piece over there that looks like cotton candy. Uh, I just discovered this one a couple years ago. These stones come and go from the commercial stone yards in Karara. Uh, frequently because of fashion. Uh, so you, one year you'll see a stone there, and the next year you can go back and, and you won't. Uh, certain stones, of course, uh, are ever popular and you can always find those, uh, not the least of which is the very famous Karara marble. Uh, but this one I'd never seen before, it might have been a new quarry that was opened up. So <clears throat> I had to have some and uh, made this scallop shell out of it, okay. Uh, really one of, the, one of the main things that got me kind of interested in biology again, or not that I was that interested in it before, I should re rephrase that, that sort of <laughs> reawakened an interest in, or awakened an interest in science, let's put it that way, uh, was the study of these little creatures. These are nudibranchs, uh, sea slugs. And I always used to see them when I dived and loved coming across them. Uh, they are tiny, many no bigger than your little fingernail, but they are just this unbelievable, diverse group of gastropods. They're, they're uh, basically green snails that have evolved out of protective shell uh, by uh, generating poison, and that's how they protect themselves. So it's, in fact, a, a very interesting side story with these. Uh, they are studied by the pharmaceutical industry, and uh, there's a lot of cancer drug potential in their chemistry. Uh, so you might ask, what do I care about a sea slug? Well, one of these guys may save your life one day. In any case, surely as sculpture, as a source for sculptural inspiration, they are amazing. Um, crazy shapes, there's four of many thousands of species, each one different color shapes, uh, they're wild. So I got involved with looking at these, uh, got a wonderful book called Nudibranch Behavior, Riveting material, uh, and actually got completely entranced by it. The, the language, the wonderful terms for their different parts, their, so the biology of something that I was really initially just looking at because I loved the form. Uh, and, okay, so I started uh, making them out of stone using my same old paradigm shift of scale. Again, this guy, uh, okay, so I did this. he's about five feet long. He's one of the bigger ones I've tried. And uh, this one exhibits lamplet, lamellet rhinophores. Those are the sensory organs in the front. Uh, these are the gill, gill plumes here. And these are called processes. Uh, but I won't bore you with all of the biology. Okay, next. Uh, they kind of, uh, some of the colored stones lend themselves, okay. A little uh, different treatment in, to, to make the gill plumes there. Uh, nudibranch means naked gill, so their name comes from, from their respiratory system, which is this part here, these are the rhinophores. And uh, so in order to approximate the gill plume 
I polish part of them and uh, sandblast the other part, in fact. Okay. So these were a lot of fun for me to explore. Next. Another bit of natural form that has always intrigued me have been insects. Uh, this was a piece that I actually did for the one sculpture course that I took at Dartmouth. I wish I had taken more, um, but uh, the, the time that I spent in the shops there making this piece, I think had, had uh, no small effect on how my life ended up. Um, you can see the, uh, the strawberry under the copper plane, praying mantis there. And once again, a little paradigm shift in scale. Uh, okay. Uh, that kind of got me intrigued again in, in the uh, exoskeletal forms. Okay. Here is an example of a giraffe beetle, fabulous beetle. Uh, and when I looked at it, that pushed me towards a, a, a quite an abstract piece, but definitely inspired by how those beetle shapes uh, connected almost like armor, or well, they are, they're armor. Uh, but the, again, those topographies became a very interesting subject to explore in the work. Okay. Uh, the insect thing also spread into adapting scrap metal. This was a wonderful period where a local scrapyard in New Haven had these parts that were from a company that did uh, brake calipers, and they had a pile literally as big as a house that came and went like the tide of these parts. So I saw them and thought, God, those look like insect legs, okay? Next. So inspired by, by a gorgeous Swiss book I have of beetle, that, that's actually a painting on the left, uh, I started working with these metal parts to create uh, some insect sculptures. Go ahead. Okay. All right. And these actually have led to something that I'm really looking forward to. I'll be exhibiting these pieces uh, at Yale's Peabody Museum next year uh, in conjunction with some of their collection of the real thing, and I'm hoping some uh, very large, uh, there's some artists doing some huge photographic work of beetles, again, blowing up these tiny creatures to reveal the magic of their shapes, okay? Uh, scale shift again, trying a little different thing, you know, dropping a human figure made out of the same parts on top of the insect. Uh, okay. And then <laughs> I couldn't resist throwing this in. Imagine what it would be like if I blew the sculpture out of the scrap metal up into an enormous piece, where then the fabricated parts, which of course are very mechanical when you look at each one, uh, take on a whole other feel, almost, almost like Mayan architecture with the blocks put together. Okay. But now we get to seeds. Uh, you've seen this one here, the flesh. Um, and we heard the story of how I encountered Rob's work. Uh, seeds really are probably one of my favorite subjects. It kind of began with an attraction to the, the mystery of, of these extraordinarily diverse natural containers for a life form where you really have no idea what is going to come out of it. You know, they, if you didn't know that an oak tree grew from an acorn, you would never, in your wildest dreams, imagine what could happen. So I've always loved that. Many of the sculptures, as you've seen in the show, are at a specific point of germination. They're kind of opening up, and a shoot is coming out, so I love kind of trying to capture that specific point. Again, with the challenge of putting, putting a, 
a live thing into stone. A bunch of different approaches, different materials, Turkish marble, okay. Beautiful black marble from Spain, again, treating the surfaces a little bit differently, okay. That's the famous Carrara marble. There's a reason why so much of the world's great statuary is done in this stone. It is uh, by grain and, and uh, ability to take whatever you want to put into it. It's really one of the best stones in the world to carve. Um, so it's always a pleasure to work in this because many of Many other stones, like this green stone, is not so easy to work in. It, it won't hold a fine edge. You have to work it on a very specific grain. Uh, but the white Carrara, uh, you can pretty much do anything you want with it. Okay. This lovely stone here, very excited. Uh, I'm going to uh, Argentina in November to a remote part of central Argentina to explore the quarry, where this comes from, hoping to uh, go down to BA for a period of time and do a body of work just in that stone. So I'm really looking forward to that. It's very beautiful. It comes from uh, an area where there's clearly a lot of ferrous material. Uh, so you've seen these, this orange blush is uh, from sort of iron stain in the stone. Okay. 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 That one's here. This picture gives you a little, little idea of what happens with light behind some of these materials. Um, okay. There's some older work uh, from another period, but also exploring that whole idea of an opening form revealing the inside and then growing into you're really not sure what. Okay. So here you see this, this piece, Rob's picture on the right. Um, when I discovered these books, thanks to Paulette, uh, the pictures were absolutely riveting, but I found the text also riveting. Uh, and again, much like the Nudebranks, uh, started reading about the various uh, things that, that were part of why a seed was shaped in a particular way, what it did, how, how it was distributed, and there's a whole language to, to these things. So again, uh, kind of an uh, angled arrival at, at a, a growing love of biology, these things. This one, I, I just got to tell you, this exhibits this wonderful bit of seed distribution technology, uh, which I never would have known without Rob's books. Um, what I've carved here, and what you see evidenced here, is it eliasome or eliasome? Eliasome. Eli they, these are called eliasomes, and they are oil-rich nubbins that certain plants have evolved. And when the seed drops to the ground, ants are attracted to the nubbin in what is called mercokery, a great word. Um, the ant collects the seed, takes it back to the nest, consumes the elizome, and discards the seed. And that is how evolution with this particular plant has managed to distribute the plant. It's just a wonderful, wonderful stuff. I, I, I have loved learning about these things, and you can see a very direct pull and effect on, on a piece of my work. Okay. Uh, another thing I've been looking at, uh, just kind of beginning to tinker with, are diatoms, uh, algae, algae forms, kind of building blocks of life. When you look closely at diatoms under the microscope, they, many exhibit these radially symmetrical, extraordinary patterns. Uh, I will take that and, uh, in using a computer program, I lay out a pattern that gets laser cut, and then uh, next, I 
often uh, reconfigure the pieces and then weld them back into the initial frame out of which they were all cut to create something like this. But uh, again, one facet, one more facet of nature that, that holds endless potential to be mined uh, if you are willing to look and uh, explore. Okay, and I'll finish with this one. Uh, my child uh, is a little older than this now, but uh, here he is with one of my Nudebrang sculptures. And uh, you know, in part, this is why it was music to my ears to hear how intrigued the kids were coming here, uh, because this connection between, between us and the natural world uh, is extremely important, and I think will play a part in whether we survive or not. Uh, so it, it needs to be maintained and encouraged. And uh, my child, for you know, right now he's 11, so I'm fighting the battle of, of keeping him off of the electronic device. But, but when he doesn't have one, he's an amazing spotter of things in nature. So I feel like I succeeded. Um, so there you go. It's, uh, the, these. This whole thing with Rob uh, is really an honor for me to show work with him because he, he comes from a, a very different, a much more academic background than I do. And I, I truly feel like I've, I've come into a, uh, come into an appreciation for and a very deep and growing interest in art and science and its possibilities. Uh, as much as a way for me to, uh, to make my work to, to imbue my work with something more than just the challenge of putting a certain object into stone or making something beautiful. Uh, my, this gives it a little more of a purpose. And if uh, you know, one, one child is amazed and changed looking at these beautiful things and maybe approaches how they consume and deal with the environment down the road, then, then uh, We've done a good thing, and there, there are many different ways that it can be done, and I think art and science in combination really uh, hold a lot of potential to effectively do that. Thank you.
and really exciting. And, and, but more to, to Gar, whose, whose idea it was in the first place, who, uh, it's, it's great to get his email. I really like your work, and would you like to do an exhibition with me? Um, so, and here we are. So that's kind of wonderful. Really. So thank you very much, Gar. It's great. And it's great to, I've hardly had a chance to see the work yet. Um, but it looks wonderful, actually. I have to come back early tomorrow, I think. Um, Okay. I'm going to show a kind of range of different things like uh, things that influence me, things I'm interested in. Uh, and this is a, a, a also actually before I start, I should say I, I understand now what it is like to be a comedian because uh, this is the fourth presentation I've given in, in 24 hours. And, you know, comedians go around the country, it's another day, another town, another gig, another audience, same old jokes. So um, I've tried to shuffle the images around for each of the presentations. So this may be as, as much a surprise to me as it is to you. <laughs> so yeah, one of my kind of favorite images, this is a great piece of turf by Albert Durer. Um, and I just really sympathize with his kind of comments. The imitation of nature produces an effect, a work of art that displays the artisan's knowledge of nature, and in itself constitutes a kind of knowledge. And this is 1503, and it's just a very humble kind of watercolor, which is in, in, in Vienna. Um, but it's almost a forensic observation of something as ordinary and as extraordinary as a, a kind of piece of turf, um, and so beautifully observed. Thanks. So how did I get into this? Um, I, uh, my father gave me a microscope when I was 10. Um, beautiful Victorian brass microscope, which I still have, uh, and I still use from time to time. And uh, I started making slides when I was 12, um, and slides on pollen. So I, you know, my credentials go back a long way. Um, and I was interested, I think my father was interested, he was an engineer, I think he liked the mechanics and the beauty of the kind of uh, the mechanism. And he, he knew I was interested in art and the living world. Um, and actually, it opened up a door to the living world, which um, was amazing to me, really. This kind of sight, so I was looking at spiders and butterfly wings and uh, all kinds of things. And also, I was, a, I was a slow reader. I didn't read very much as a child. I, mean, I was kind of a slow reader, but I was a, a consumer of images and books and scientific books um, at the patterns uh, and the way that things were kind of laid out very simply. And I had to choose in that age between studying biology and art. I couldn't do both at school. So I, I opted for biology and got halfway through and um, bombed out. Um, it was not, it, it was, I was interested in the living world and this was quite detached from that. So they said, I think you better. I think you better do art. So my kind of pattern was set from then on. Um, this, is a, this is an important image. This is uh, one of the very first photographic, micro photographic images from 1940 from um, Andreas Ritter von Ettinghausen. And it's a section through the stem of Clematis. And prior to this, artists and scientists had worked together. Scientists, explorers around the world needed artists to draw, to record, to illustrate their work. The, what they were looking at for identification, for confirmation, and coincidentally celebration. Um, but this was the birth, this was the time when photography was emerging. And at that point, the camera and the microscope came together. And inadvertently, that locked out the access for the artist. And over the next hundred years, the complexity of science and the technology and the cost of it became very prohibitive. And really, knowledge became more dense, and we all kind of moved off into our own silos. Um, but we move on in time. Um, so this is one of my images. It's made of about 600 photographs. Um, and the final image is about three times that size, in fact. It's a section through an iris, stained section. Um, and now, I think, 
particularly the last 20 years, there's been a growing realization that it's good to talk to each other. We have, I, we have things which we can share. We have questions we can ask each other, which don't get asked in those, our own communities. And also we share the, the same technologies. The digital kind of revolution has made things possible. The same applications, the same programs. Um, and I think, uh, as an artist, I've always felt I had a license to kind of uh, gently push doors open and to see what was on the other side. Uh, and this is what I did in, uh, at the end of the, end of the 90s. I'd come to a whole cycle, end of a cycle of work, and I was looking back at old microscopic images, and I thought, no one's really using these as a creative source. And I'd always taken students to Kew Gardens, the Royal Botanic Gardens Kew in London, fantastic uh, place. And so I asked them at the reception, I said, can you tell me, give me some of the names of the people who kind of run the different labs? And I wrote in, and I got just one reply, about 40 letters, and just one reply, and that was from Madeleine Harley. And she was head of research into Paul. And this is one of her plates here. And she had an earlier career as an interior designer. And so she knew the kind of visual kind of strength of her work. And she wanted to do an exhibition of her photographs of, of Paul. Uh, but at that time, I don't think people, I mean, particularly Q, they didn't think there was an audience. They thought it was scientific images. It's not really, it's not really an audience for a kind of general public audience. And so I came along and, and uh, she thought, here's an opportunity to kind of move things on a bit. Um, and she showed me her work and the images were stunning. I mean, this is a kind of art, it's a very typical plate. So you have the whole pollen grains down the left hand side and you have sections through, and you have kind of the surface detail. And these are very interesting in terms of documentary photography, but they don't necessarily engage kind of wider audiences. Um, and as an artist, I really want to, want everyone to see my work. I mean, it's kind of the, the ego of the artist in a sense, but I want to kind of share it. And so I, I thought it was an opportunity. We started working together, and uh, she showed me how to use the electron microscope. Um, and this is a, an early image of mine on the right of a pollen grain of convolvulus bindweed. Magnified about 2,000 times. And so we started, I started collecting pollen samples and working them up. And we I started presenting them alongside the original flower they came from. What was interesting is we had we had some shared languages. So she would describe the kind of surface of pollen grains as being sculpted or ornamental. But we also had differences. So when she prepares a pollen sample to photograph, to look at on the microscope, she would wash it, she would uh, freeze dry it and make sure it's perfectly uh, inflated to show it off its best. Whereas I was going out and collecting and shortcutting a bit, I put it into the microscope. Quickly, I wouldn't wash it, I wouldn't freeze dry it. Uh, and this is a collapsed specimen, so it wouldn't normally show a collapsed specimen. But for me, it had a very beautiful vessel like feel to it. You could almost feel as though some hands had been kind of modeling that with clay. Uh, and I think that was one of the kind of differences, it started to kind of throw up differences in how we work. So, this is how I work. Um, this is, um, I'm very fortunate. Great wife and uh, a long life supporter. Um, and we have a house in the studio in Greece. So this is outside my studio. It's in Nemini. Excellent. Um, and this is one of the drawings. And I work in different ways. I work in many different ways. So this is a, a drawing with ink and dye. Excellent. And that's the anther from that anemone. And that's one pollen grain from the same plant. Um, and I'm also aware that I work in, <coughs> in a long tradition. This is by um, an artist called Giovanni Ferrari, Italian, 1638. Um, and it's um, seed uh, of uh, 
Francis. Um, and, and even in 1638, their powers of observation were very good. So this is one of the images which is on the wall over there. Um, and I think I also in, enjoy the way they, they construct their images, showing different parts, and the kind of the way this kind of type of script runs through it. So uh, this is a project which I haven't, I've only just kind of started, and um, partly because the last three years I've, I've had a full-time kind of post as chair of Art Design and Science at the university, where I've been trying to make connections for my students uh, from across the university with the science community. So this one has been on hold a little bit, so I need to resurrect it. But this is a, a print I bought on our drive down to uh, Italy a couple of years ago. This is in Parma, and I came across it in a small antique kind of print shop. Uh, and I bought it for $100, and it's from a very known, important kind of botanical collection. It's a hand-colored woodcut by uh, Pietro Mattioli um, from 1568. And it's uh, of Nampola Preysum, which is a wild leek. And I bought that one because um, this plant had already worked with. And so there's, a, there's the kind of the flower in, in real life. <coughs> Um, and this is a cyanotype of the same plant. Um, and I've since been back to the, to, the, uh, to the shop and I bought five more prints. And my idea is to do a series of works using different uh, visualizations. So cyanotype, you know, it's one of the earliest forms of photographic um, printing processes where you, you coat the paper with a mixture of uh, potassium ferric cyanide and something else. Um, and when it's dry, you lay a specimen on top and you expose it to light and then you put it in a little water and you wash out. So where the light is obscured, um, the dye is washed off the paper. So you get these very beautiful, soft kind of uh, silhouette negatives. And here's the seed head as it starts to dry. Uh, and that's the image which is over in the corner of one of those dried florets of that seed head. And as the seed heads, the seeds start to open up, the actual uh, seed pod, you can start to see the kind of little nutlets inside. And those are the seeds. And if you look a bit closer, that's the surface of the seed. Um, and this is magnified probably a couple of hundred times, maybe. Um, but you, have, you can see this kind of articulated structure so that it allows it, the seed to uh, shift and move um, and change shape as it grows and as it kind of shrinks, as it dries. And I think as an artist, I'm, I'm always looking for connections between things. So this is a photograph of my son's uh, from, uh, uh, from much time. Um, and it made me think about how cities grow, how urban cultures grow, how we shift and move and add and adapt to fit and, and work together. Um, this is from a book by Philip Ball, who's an English science writer, he writes very well. I highly recommend his books. They're quite, um, quite modest in science, but they really articulate aspect, different aspects of science really well. Um, and here he's talking about Leonardo, this is one of Leonardo's drawings of water. And he's saying he had to sit and stare for hours, not to see things more sharply, but as it were, to stop seeing, to transcend the limitations of the eyes. And as Garth mentioned, I think seeing, looking, is, is something of a forgotten art, and something that I always try to get my students to do more, kind of looking. Um, and, I, and when I first started working on the microscopes, my kind of colleagues said, oh, you you know, you, that's fine. So I'm lucky to get access to that, to see these things. But actually what I realized was I hadn't been using my own eyes to their kind of same degree. So I was looking closer just through, the, through being kind of spurred on in this kind of technology. So this is how I, this is kind of my working process in a way. So this is a, an orchid, it's a Laxiflora orchid outside my studio in Corfu. I mean, I'm very lucky in spring, it is, you, I mean, literally you drive over the orchids to get to the house sometimes. Um, and this is um, early days of the studio, so it's quite basic inside in a way. Uh, simple drawing table. 
And what I do, I'll go out and I'll pick a flower and I'll put it on the table and I'm, I'm going to do a drawing using ink, India ink, and aniline dye. Aniline is a very strong kind of dye. Uh, and I'll mix the ink with the dye. So I've got these pots of, they're all, they're all black. And I paint a silhouette of that flower. And after a couple of minutes, and it depends on how warm it is or, uh, it's an uh, instinct. Uh, I put the whole paper under the tap and wash the residues of ink off. And so that you're left um, with this kind of drawing of the flower. Um, and it's the kind of process I evolved. I was trying to do some drawings a few years ago, which were sort of accurate illustrations, and, and they, were, they were pretty rubbish actually. I kind of lost the kind of skill. It didn't capture anything of the plant. Whereas working this way, I found I could capture really quite a, an accurate, almost representation of it, but something which was a, my emotional response to that plant as well. And it take me uh, ten minutes to do, whereas some of the other images can take me 100, 150 hours. So it's an interesting contrast. And I used the camera, and the camera enables me to do other things. So this is in Portugal. I'm looking at a butterfly orchid. And when you kind of look closely, you realize what well, you're sharing the subject with other beings. So this is a, um, this is a little beetle. Um, this is actually a different orchid. This is a, uh, an Italian orchid. This is a butterfly again, looking down the throat of that kind of the flower. And then when you kind of look at the, that throat under the microscope, you can see it's got these uh, very fine trichome hairs which have a variety of kind of functions, but um, they are sort of navigation lays for insects passing over them. And if you cut the stem in half, you can see, and you stain it, and you do the right other things to it, you can start to see some of the structures, the complex patterns that make up the stem of that plant. And then if you collect one of the seed pods and you shake the seeds out, you can see the seeds. And, and Orchid, pot, uh, orchid uh, seeds are tiny, it's just like dust, really, really fine, but they mostly have this kind of characteristic cellular quality. So, metamorphosis is a much used word, and this is a nigella, uh, kind of loving the mist. And it transforms from the flower to a kind of fresh seed pod emerging with this kind of crown of gentle thorns around it kind of wither away as the plant dries and becomes desiccated. And these are the seeds that are inside. And they're armor coated really. They're, they're designed so they can be thrown out into rough terrain. When you look closely at that kind of coating and you start to kind of ask questions, why is it? What's happening here? What's causing those cells to grow faster and push up like a, a mountain ridge? And so that then caused me to go and ask people who might know. And I suppose that's what I hope my work provokes in, in, uh, in other people. So working with Madeline, um, I, I was very fortunate. I did a project which attracted um, one person who really made it possible to, to have the funding from, from Nesta for three years to work at Q alongside my teaching. Um, and my manager on the project said, I give you three, I give you six months to get a book deal together. So I've heard you talk about it twice now. So, uh, and these are some of the images we've, we've been doing. These are all pollen images from different plants. Um, and so we went cold calling around the book fair in London. And the, the book publishers, big ones, the five and the and that's the big ones, they loved the images, but they, they didn't know where to put it in the bookshop. They didn't think there was an audience for it. And you put it in photography and gardening. But Madeline and I strongly believe there, was a, there could be a big audience for this. You can't help but be fascinated by this. And we kind of, we found one publisher, Papa Bikers, who, they were a small publisher, a very small kind of, uh, one man really, in his family almost. Um, and uh, he published books on architecture and design. And his daughter had just left the architecture school and she was a designer. And it's said, okay, we'll, we'll give it a try. You know. It'll be small, you won't make any money. Um, but as we started bringing the material in, 
the book grew in size, um, and it grew to 250 odd pages. And it was published, um, and it was very popular. Being a small publisher, they didn't have the muscle to get it into the big bookshops, but it sold through word of mouth, through the internet. Um, and at the launch of the Pollen book, Wolfgang Stuckey, who's a seed morphologist from the Millennium Seed Bank at Q, said, Hey, he said, Do you want to do a book on seeds? This is great. So we did a book on seeds, and then we followed that up with a book on fruit, uh, which we trans was translated into German and Spanish, uh, and another book from French, and in I'm not sure what language that is. Um, <laughs> and the, uh, the books have been remarkable, really. I think it's sold over 160,000 copies around. They're published in the US as well. Uh, and uh, they've created an audience for me that I could, I could barely have imagined through just kind of having exhibitions. This wouldn't have happened had it not been for the books, really. And that's, um, that's a fantastic feeling to know that kind of so many people are kind of um, hopefully getting something what you've done and um, kind of sharing. And also Q uh, realized the kind of value of what I've done. Um, and so they, they, this is their five year plan published last year, their science strategy. Um, so it's got all the languages on the back and front cover, some Wolfgang's as well. Uh, and so they, they use some of my images for, for purposes like this, for non-commercial. And I get to use their microscope. <laughs> Um, so I just want to say a bit about colour, because um, no one's asked me yet about the colour, because um, the images start out as black and white, as you originally saw, and so I, I add the colour. Um, and the colour is based on a number of things. It's based on looking at the original plant, the colour of the plant. It's based on functional characteristics, so the kind of little blobs at the bottom, the alive so kind of bringing those out in a different colour. And then the papier hairs at the top, which help the seed carry on the wind, those are kind of based on the kind of flower colour. Um, and I'll say, just as plants will use colour to attract an audience of insects for pollination, um, I'll use colour to attract you. You're, you're my audience. Um, and and also, you know, the plants need dispersal mechanisms. So the wind and other insects. Um, but my dispersal mechanisms are books and exhibitions. Uh, and the internet. So, uh, a few months last year, I googled this image. I wanted to check something about the flower, not the image, but just the flower. And I had about seven out of the first ten hits. And that's because it had been in an article in the, in the Odebom magazine. And so, the power of that kind of dissemination is, is uh, you know, one can't underestimate in a way. So, I was going to run quickly through a few uh, images. And I'm trying to show kind of something of the lusciousness. I mean, finally, I should say also that the other aspect of colour is that it's my response to that particular specimen. It's uh, I, I, what I feel that it needs to be um, uh, bringing out the character of the specimen in my response to it. So this is so you get an image like this. This is um, a South African seed. And when it rains, it does that. So it spreads out very quickly to come and gather any moisture it can to hopefully root. Uh, and these are scabious seeds, sea holly. Same, different, different uh, species, but same family, kind of spikes and hooks. And more hooks, I mean, classic uh, animal distribution, really, hooking onto your clothes. But these are, this is only about two millimeters across. Uh, this is about the size of a pea. It's a cremaria, again, it's an African seed. Uh, and this is a um, Castellaya flavor. Uh, I'm not sure what it is, a yellow paintbrush, I think. Um, and it's a balloon seed. And so the embryo of the seed is the green part inside. And this outer casing um, looks like it's packaging to kind of make sure the seed doesn't get damaged. And it's partly that, but actually it's really to give it a bigger wind profile so it blows on the wind. Uh, another image from here, which um, it's really, uh, it's just so spoke of kind of all those images of the green man kind of mythology. Mm -hmm. 
lace like, also wind blown. I mean, they're very architectural, structural, um, and incredibly fragile. Some look like in fashion garments, is, is my argument, silver. And like the one here, um, which just seemed just such a fragile silk, uh, balletic character. Um, so, as a see, this is a fruit, so this is a fig. Um, it's a very small fig, not much bigger than a fig, a, a pea. Uh, and when you may or you may not know that fig is, a, is an enclosed, it's an inflorescence. So, um, inside here, we've got the anthers with a pollen in. And a fig, like all flowers, needs a pollinator. And it's the fig wasp. And so this is about two millimeters long, uh, and, the, and the figs crawl up the little aperture at the end of the fig, and they mate and they lay their eggs. Uh, and the female young fly out, and the male young kind of cut the holes for the females to, to fly out, but they die. Um, but the other thing about them when they fly out is the coat on. So these are pollen grains on the thorax of that uh, little wasp. So it gives you some idea of scale also there. It's in fact, wasp, two millimeters, and it's a black speck. You don't realize you're eating them. I bet you look closer to the next time you eat a pig bag. I'm guaranteed. So just to give you some idea of process, so this is this image here on the top right. It's a Medicargo seed. So, um, pollen, you can get lots, you have millions of pollen grains onto one slide image, and that's what the scanning electron microscope is good at doing. But working with Wolfgang Stubby, we were trying to look at big things, and that's quite, you know, we're pushing the kind of limits. So we weren't magnifying them hugely, maybe, maybe 60 times, um, but you couldn't do it in one, one shot. So this, the first, first thing you do, you coat the specimen in a microfine layer of platinum, and then you put it into a vacuum chamber, where it's bombarded with electrons, which bounce off, and what happens is this. So I'm taking multiple frames here, going backwards and forwards across the specimen. And then I have to go through painstakingly cleaning up the background pixel by pixel. And when the specimens are very hairy, uh, it takes a long time. And then I introduce the colour, building up until I, I feel I've reached the right point. And the other thing when you start to look, you think, okay, Medicargo, uh, it's got a big family, it's got a lot of Medicargo, Medic plants. And they, they all have the same characteristic, it's kind of spiral construction, but some are very spiky, some light spikes, some no spikes at all. And then and then you get one which is like this coming, this next one, and that's a tree medic. So all the others are very small, but this one's a tree. Somehow this one grew into a tree, uh, and the sea is much, much bigger. There we go. Um, I couldn't do this without um, uh, a, lot of, a lot of people kind of helping, um, and uh, friend, they're all, they've all become friends really. Um, and kind of support from different foundations, um, as you know, you know, the kind of Andrew Mellon Foundation, at the university. For the so that's um, that's my journey, and hopefully that kind of sheds a bit of light on how I work with scientists. Do you guys want to take like, a little break and then we can go into questions? Or do you want to go right into questions? What do you think? Well, you guys, I, I can, I can, uh, I can walk on. Okay, let's keep going. Um, thank you, everybody. 
uh, you'll notice that you have a evaluation form on your seat with a pencil. So please fill that out and either leave it on the desk or give it to Rich before you take off this evening. Um, I have some questions for you guys. I know we usually have an audience who has a lot of questions to ask you. So you know, if you have anything that you're interested about, please raise your hand and um, we'd love to get to them. Um, just so to start off, where, where do you think that the observation skills of an artist and scientist intersect? I think both of you are coming from a science background, and there you have in the family. Um, but do you think that the observation and these visual skills overlap in any way? Um, you could just talk about that a little bit. Um. Yeah, I think I, th I mentioned that one of the things I'm interested in is pattern. And uh, when I was, uh, in, I was in Portugal and uh, fellowship with Nicole Benke, and I was, um, spent some time with, with one scientist, and she was looking at uh, a number of different diseases as, as they were evidenced through the kind of blood. So she was looking at blood samples. So she was looking at hundreds of slides, I mean, literally hundreds of slides of blood cells. And she's looking for something which uh, isn't like all the others. And so it is to do with kind of uh, being able to scan something and, and looking lots of times. And then you become clear about what is the difference between one thing and another. Uh, and it's familiarity. Um, it is repetition. It is doing it lots of times and, uh, and being observant. And I think that's you know, what I was saying about. I, I'm useless at remembering names, but I'm very good that kind of remembering kind of places and objects and things that I've seen. And I think observing within science, I mean, there are a few science scientists here, so maybe they can also uh, uh, pitch in on this. But I think observation, and, I mean, I think one of the things that um, you know, I was asked to describe you know, what art is to the, to the scientist out there, and I said it's a bit like art and science is the same thing. You know, we use a series of filters to look at things from the living world. And we change the filters and we see what that does. Does it make it any clearer? Does it kind of reveal something we haven't seen before? Um, and, that's a, and that's the same for a scientist and an artist. Really. Um, if that answers the question. Yeah, um, a couple of words written there. Uh, pattern, pattern recognition in particular. Uh, both artists and scientists look for it. Scientists, of course, are approaching the subject to record uh, specific facts and truths. Artists kind of have a more of a luxury in that they're allowed to interpret. But particular things attract us as artists. Uh, and in a way, that's pattern recognition. You're culling through this vast array of, of input, and but only certain things land, and there's a reason for it. And, and because we're all so different, uh, different things are going to appeal to us, thank heavens. Uh, but in terms of your question, yeah, there's, there's so much intersection between the two. Uh, yeah, I hadn't uh, thought of this. Glass sculpture, which is in front of me here, is a, is a really good example uh, because it's uh, there are two parts to the form, and the one part is highly polished and the other isn't, and it's the same piece of stone. Visually, they're kind of we know that because you know, we're used to looking, but actually, it's quite different in character, um, and it's the kind of polishing which is the the lens that we're looking through, which reveals the pattern in, in this kind of blade on this kind of seat point. Here. I think it's just kind of the clarity of the lens um, that we kind of that we use as artists and scientists that reveal kind of things which maybe other people might not see. And this this piece uh, is another inspiration from Rob's books, uh, from a, actually a photograph in them of the California gray pine seed, and these seeds like the the one on the wall to the left there. And that piece on the wall there, uh, the process of distribution by wind is called anemochory, a word I learned from 
from the book. <laughs> and, and that is what is involved with these seeds, that, that thin, flat blade allows, much like the maple leaf, allows the seed to helicopter down and stretch further away. And this particular stone, this is a, a green stone from Iran, and you can see, if you look this way, the striations run very strongly like this. And this stone, if you tried to make something that was skinny this way, it would literally, you could snap it very easily by hand. And this, this particular material has this incredibly strong grain, so you, you work with it. Is there any limitations to what you can do with it? Such a beautiful material I couldn't resist. <laughs> and if any of you have questions, I, I didn't get that much in the process of my thing, and I'm sorry. But if you have any questions about how these are carved, I will answer them. This is obviously polished here, but this is the same stone, just unpolished. Absolutely. It's actually, I, I use a uh, I use a tool on it. I don't even know what the, well, it, it's a kind of bush hammer. That's the English word for it. In Italian, it's a bucha, much nicer than a bush hammer. But it's basically there, it's a square with a bunch of rectangular teeth in it, and you put it in your air hammer and you go da, 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 like that, and it bruises the stone. That's how you get that. Uh, yeah. Does the, I think for you as material um, as well as color and color, does the color inform to be the form of the thing or does the form more involve the color that we talk about? Uh, both, yeah. both actually. And, and again, it, it, it's uh, frequently just practicality. What, what stone do I have in hand? What pieces have I found at that particular time? Uh, certain shapes go well in certain kinds of stone. So, the colors, you know, you can't lose with these materials. They're such gorgeous materials that, you know, you're almost cheating. You're just cleaning them up and showing off what was already there. Uh, Finally, yes. I do as well in a sense. I'm just showing what was already there and <laughs> translating. Uh, you know, well, it's kind of some of the seeds are just kind of brown. I mean, they're kind of, I, mean, I haven't got one here, but the poppy seeds are on your, on your nothing. Uh, they're pretty they're fantastic seeds, mm -hmm. and uh, they're, kind of, they're a little bit hard plated in a different way. Uh, so it's kind of revealing that through, through my process. That these are not exotic sources. Uh, that, that white nudibranch that you saw on the slideshow. Uh, is actually indigenous to Long Island Sound. Uh, so you, you really only have to look out your back door. These are not alien creatures, they are already on us. And, uh, and again, it's, it's the observation and the willingness to, to scratch the surface that, that uh, can allow you to open up that world. I have a question about. Um, you spoke um, about using the, the camera to observe nature. Yes. But I have a young friend who's going to the um, University of Mastery. There's a program there with scientific illustration okay. where um, you know, they, they do, um, they study specimens and draw them um, for scientific illustration. Why do they not just take photographs? OK. So, um, it's a different thing. Um, I mean, it's a complex issue. But, um, they can reveal characteristics and aspects of the specimen that might be hidden by the photograph. Photographs don't tell the truth. Uh, it really, depends on the local length, distance. Uh, and it's the illustration and the way that they want to do it in a scientific form is a standardized form trying to get it to do the exact kind of thing. So uh, there's less room for interpretation. Now, uh, I didn't show it, but I, uh, yesterday I talked about, I used a slide, 
and it's a quote from the director of the Italian Garden in Vienna, and, and it's from a big book he did on uh, wonderful illustrations like some of the show. And he said, uh, botanical art beauty um, is a kind of irrelevant side effect. It has nothing to do with art, really. Uh, it's just kind of, it's irrelevant. So, um, I did meet him, uh, and I determined that actually I thought he was wrong. And, and the reason why I say he's wrong is because uh, he's only thinking of one audience. And, and there are multiple audiences beyond the intended audience. And also, it's a good thing for the artist. Why, you know, why, why are Odebons, uh, for instance, far more valuable um, than anybody else's? Because he was a good artist. So, uh, they fulfilled two functions. They fulfilled the function of the illustration, and they were kind of uh, beautiful artists. Uh, and there is a conflict. I, I have a, a friend in London, she wants she started doing um, uh, you know complete flower plates. So typically in an illustration you might have the flower and you might have the detail, the leaf and the stamens. And she was doing it meticulously and photographically. Uh, and the Royal Horticultural Society, who she kind of worked for, would not accept her illustrations. Um, and the Kew, Kew Gardens, the gallery there, which is uh, funded by a particular person, she won't allow photographic images in there. And I, I, I'm, I'm a great uh, debunker of diary history. I mean, I think it, uh, it, it lingers how we can see it. So, um, there is a difference between a drawing and a photograph. And they can bring out different things. Um, I think there's an emotional detachment in the scientific that they're trying to aim for. Um, but that's not so easy. Yeah, I actually read on that point, and I think one of the things that, that I remember, this was a while ago, was that the illustration is something that tries to catch the main features or the type, not specific things about the individual. Plant. And so sometimes things about a, one specimen that can draw very, very accurately. That's not true of all the other specimens of that same kind of plant. So you want to get something that's more general on the version of that. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so that was an interesting thing. I have a question about your SEM images. So you color them by putting them into something like um, a computer program. No. How do you? Well, I do. I do. Okay. So yes and no. So, um, because you, there are... there's a zillion details in there. If you were just to like, Colored over. Okay. Um, <laughs> introduce us with it, I describe it as being hand colored. And I, I, I use that description for a very particular reason. And that's because when I started doing uh, the work, people would ask that question is this the kind of real color? And I say, well, no, because you have to prepare the specimen, so I have the color. And so they say, so it's false color. And false color is a, is a scientific term, and they'll, they'll add color to their images through particular programs. And it'll, it'll, it'll pick out the features that they want it to show. Um, but they're not using it in any emotional sense. Uh, and it's, they're limited in, in the way it can be used. Um, in some cases, you know, there's very strict rules about what they can do. So I say, no, it's, it's, not, it's not false color in the way that it's used in the program. I'm adding color just through Photoshop in a very sophisticated, painstaking way. Um, and as I've said before, you know, no one said to Monet that water is. Is that the real color? Uh, is, that, is that false color? No, it's my color. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, um, so, it is, so, to tell you if you want to know, I mean, I'll, uh, you saw that black and white thing being built up. So, I'll get to a black and white image. And then I'll introduce color, I'll make lots of layers, and I'll make all the layers slightly different, and I'll erase that through. But the, the tonal kind of structure of it, not the tonal structure, the uh, the contrast of that doesn't, doesn't change. So I don't change the, the form of the detail, uh, but I will change to uh, give one example. So uh, it's probably easier for you to see. So in this example here, uh, I did um, just change the color just around here. I just kind of burnt in that orange just a little bit more. The, the visual information didn't change other than the color, but that gives the kind of depth around the Spot. So, uh, no scientist would do that. There's no reason for them to do it. <laughs> they haven't got the time anyway. Um, 
So that's that's my that's my kind of free to do that. I'm glad I don't have to do that. <laughs> Now the colouring is a fun part. Blacking out around something like this. Um, yeah. Because there are about there are about 40 frames in that image. And you're working at uh, it means anything about 560 dpi, which is higher than normal. And you zoom right in, and, yeah, that gets a bit tedious. So. <laughs> I've got I need the system. It sounds like a polish. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it is. Yeah. Yeah. The description of how you made this one here using so many frames, that would imply that you can't magnify the one piece adequately without sectioning it? No, you can't get, you know, it's, it's a very big specimen, so you can't get far, far enough away uh, from the specimen to get the whole thing in. So, um, this is it's on, the, it's, on out, it's on the wall outside, so the, the, the green mini uh, image on the other side of that wall. If you, uh, that, that was again, it was about 40 frames, and you had to go right in. Um, but the magnification of it is about, I mean, about 60 times. When you put it together, it becomes more. But if you look at the detail, it's, it's phenomenal. So up in the top right hand corner of the disc, there are two little star heads which Notice them, but by going zooming right in, you can do that. It's an astonishing amount of Easier cleaning up, although you have to go in and out of all the kind of crenellations around the outside and in the colouring. Uh, I know this one was about 120 hours. Mm -hmm. But you know, we're all, we're all, there ain't no jobs in life where you can avoid cheating. You have to wash up. towards the photographic image. So I'll show some different material in that which, which raises kind of questions about the photographic image and what that is and how you see it. Um, because one of the questions that didn't come up tonight was actually um, how does the art world see it? And how does the science world see it? Um, and the science world kind of sees these very favourably. Um, the art world tends to ignore them. Uh, and, and like the art world didn't know what to do with photography for a long time. So now it's accepted. You have very expensive photographs. But art and science, I'm not quite sure where to put it, just like the publishers. And, and also, they don't, have, they don't know enough in order to be able to kind of judge from one image against another. Um, and, I, I wonder how the engineering school would enjoy something like this. Um, because this is really about form and function and, yeah. and just endlessly fascinating evolutionary thing. I just was wondering the structural things. I just it would be interesting if the how a bunch of engineers would enjoy this. Um, well, interesting, I mean, I think in terms of, we say art and science, and it's just a short term, it's yeah. actually um, interaction between all that. So art and science and engineering 
and design and architecture. And the other aspect that's changing things is the ability to access material. So with an architecture, whereas the plant forms have been a kind of visual metaphor, uh, now they're really to that growth principle. It's almost down to what's happening at the molecular level that we can emulate in terms of yeah, yeah. self-healing buildings or, and synthetic biology. Um, so I think it, it, it's, it's, uh, the engineers are very interested. I mean, yeah. the, and 3D printing, I mean, the tech, yeah. uh, 3D technologies of visualizing architectural form uh, are making a lot of things possible. Thank you. I was thinking.